सर वेबिनार स्टार्ट हो गए थैंक यू जैसे ही प्रोफेसर पंकज जो ज्वाइन कर रहे हैं उनको राइट्स दे दीजिएगा Hi, Dr. Santoro. How are you? I'm very glad to uh, join this. Sir. Thank you very much for inviting me. Sir. You look fresh and healthy. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you look so, sir. Yeah, yeah. I I have become monk, <laughs> more And like a monk. This is very hot season. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. This is a very hot season. Yeah. I I had uh, there are three seasons in Delhi: hot, yeah. hotter, and hottest. It, this is <laughs> hottest season. <sir. laughs> yeah, I had. Yeah. How are you now? Are you in Japan or in Washington? Uh, now in Tokyo, sir. Uh, so in the Hudson okay. Institute, uh, non-resident, fellow non-resident, sir. Okay. So you are opening a new office of Hudson in in Tokyo, huh? Hudson. Uh, it depends on the Hudson's uh, decision, sir. But anyways, uh, yes, some uh, non-residents are staying. Uh, all of them are Hudson members, and uh, deep relation between U.S. and Japan is uh, progressing very well. Uh, Hudson yeah. established Japan chair. That's true, sir. So you are one of one of the flag bearers of the Hudson Institute, huh? I hope so, sir. <laughs> <laughs> no. So you must be missing a lot of ice cream in Washington D.C. That's true, sir. Indeed, true, sir. Because ice cream is completely different between Tokyo and Washington. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, more like. Yeah, two weeks ago I was in Washington again and uh, enjoyed ice cream as a breakfast. And okay. the, I realized how different. <laughs> <laughs> no, the ice cream over there, you can eat tubs of it and you don't gain fat. It's, uh, you know, light. It's very light ice cream, which I, I, I yeah, Indeed, to. I have already increased my weight. So 13 kilograms in one year. That's a very different. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, it's a healthy ice cream, I will say. Healthy or not depends on the yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> We are we are the uh, yeah, academic yeah, yeah, experts. Yeah. We can change the definition okay. always. <laughs> sure, sure. Okay, uh, has everybody joined? Let me check. Yeah, timing is just uh, same with Shangri La dialogue. Yeah. So many people are listening to Shangri La dialogue. <laughs> Okay, okay, okay. That's good, that's good. Uh, I'll ask the center guys if we can start now. Okay. Uh, yes, uh, Remy we can and Ryan, can we start Yukti or? Uh, I think yes, sir. We can start now. Okay. Uh, Femi, we can start now. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. 
then I will speak. So, am I audible? Yes, Remy. Um, okay, okay. The Center for Security Studies was established in 2020 as the Jindal School of International Affairs first student-run research center under the aegis of Professor Dr. Pangaj Keja. CSS, as its name suggests, is dedicated to the study of security in today's international environment, which has seen the development of the importance of security across all levels, including individuals, societies, political bodies, and international organizations. Part of the activities of the center are to regularly hold online lectures through which attendants and student researchers in the field gain first-hand knowledge from experts. Today's session is on India and Japan's strategic partnership, looking into its future and expectations. This year, India and Japan are celebrating 70 years of diplomatic ties. Over the decades, this relationship has matured into one of India's most strategic partnerships with cooperation across numerous fields, including defense and security. Talking on this very important topic, we have with us today Dr. Satoru Nagao, who is a non-resident fellow at Hudson Institute based in Tokyo, Japan. Dr. Nagao's primary research area is US-Japan-India security cooperation. He was awarded his PhD by Gakushuin University in 2011 for his thesis, India's Military Strategy, the first such research thesis on this topic in Japan. Gakushuin University is a premier institution from which members of the Japanese imperial family have also graduated. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh -huh. We will, we will now have Professor Chang say a few words. Uh, uh, thank you, Ram. Thank you. Uh, you uh, we really the greatest friend of India, particularly from Japan, uh, Dr. Satoru Nagao. And he has been working in the because I think back. Uh, I think not wrong in Hyderabad. Uh, for, uh, not. Uh, Professor, you aren't audible. Uh, we speak to Satura's, uh, Dr. Satura's, it's very profound and it has been very uh, helpful. Uh, progressing India towards Japan. It's a wonderful writing to Satura. And in fact, that Tokyo becomes the epicenter of politics. We would definitely him to shed some light about Tokyo the approach with regard to global geopolitics and how it is leading up for future. And uh, Dr. Gita Gita took kindly give some in Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor. Uh, Gitanjali, ma'am, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, firstly, I'd like to thank the Center for Security Studies and I'd like to thank uh, Jindal uh, School of International Affairs for inviting me to moderate the session. Uh, I'd also like to thank uh, Professor Jha for giving me the opportunity to be a part of this August gathering and uh, also the young uh, students in here. Having said that, I'd also like to thank uh, Dr. Nagao for joining us today, sir. And uh, let's begin on that. So in, 2000, in the 2000s decade, uh, it marked a major change in the international relations between India and Japan as it led to the global partnership in the 21st century in 2002. This was followed by India-Japan partnership in a new Asian era, which was basically the strategic orientation of India and Japan global partnership in 2005. 2007 marked another major change when former Prime Minister Shinzo Abe gave his iconic speech, the Conference of Two Seas, in the Indian Parliament and highlighted Japan's broader Asia concept, focusing on the Indian Ocean and the Pacific Ocean. Here onwards, we could see that there was only growth between India and Japan, whether it was the Quad or the 2015 Special Strategic and Global Partnership 
for peace and prosperity of the Indo-Pacific region and the world. They set the stage for stronger strategic relations between India and Japan. Further, the synergy of India's Act East policy and in Japan's free and open Indo-Pacific vision, the relations between both the countries uh, deepened in the domain of defense. And this was seen that uh, both the countries specialize in defense equipment, technology, protection of military information, and et cetera. In the most recent visit of Prime Minister Modi to Japan, we also saw that how both the countries worked upon defense manufacturing. We have also seen that India and Japan are aiming to work on electromagnetic field, space, and outer space domains. All this only indicates that India and Japan are paving a, great, a, a better way and a stronger way for strategic partnership. May I now request our guest, Dr. Saturo Nagao, to enlighten us about what could be the future and expectations of India-Japan strategic partnership. Sir, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. And thank you very much for inviting me. Yes, uh, today uh, I uh, uh, try to explain the future of the India-Japan relations um, from Tokyo. So that is a privilege for me. And thank you very much for joining. Uh, I will use the PowerPoint, so I will share the PowerPoint from now and explain one by one. Okay. And uh, huh? I, ah, okay, wait seconds. It's okay. The, uh, this is not slideshow, but uh, maybe you can see the how to control. Okay. Hmm. Well, anyway, you can see the display, so you can understand. I think. Yes. yes can see. Jap yeah. Thank you. In the Japanese strategic partners, future and expectation. And that is the title. Uh, I, the organizer set up. And I try to explain about this title. This is very good title. Mm. But indeed, uh, when we check the India-Japan relation, yes, everyone say, seven, this is 70 years. Wow, good. But at the same time, when we remember the last 70 years, we understand that this relation is indeed quite new. 15 years and 20 years, the history has completely different. Because uh, last uh, 20 years, India-Japan relation has progressed very well. Look like this. Look like this, look, look this picture. Prime Minister Shinzo Abe, Prime Minister Modi, hug each other. That's very good relations. Yes, but that has happened last 20 years. Before, the, um, before 20, 20 years ago, indeed, uh, India and Japan both realized that our relation has progressed, but very limited. That 20 years relation has improved drastically. And but uh, still, uh, we found the relation has not developed enough. This is the number of the Indian or number of the Japanese staying in the, these countries. Indian live in Japan, yes, compare with the Indian live in the United States, India live in Australia, or Indian live in China, Indian live in Japan is quite a limited number. In case of the Japanese live in India, the same situation. US, Australia, China, yes, this is a number. But uh, Japanese live in India, quite limited. But this has progressed a lot indeed, five times bigger than the 2005. So last 15 years, this has increased five times, but still very limited. So when we see the development of the relation between India and Japan, indeed, the area we developed the relation is security, not economy, not the cultural cooperation. Indeed, security relation has developed. That is the reason when we talk about India and Japan relations, we cannot forget the security aspect, especially Kuwait is very important. So that's why today I focusing on Kuwait. 
And because I'm Japanese, and uh, because I try to lecture in, uh, to the Indian side, I will try to explain what is Japan's role in the world. And uh, of course, after the, my lectures, uh, I will accept the questions. So uh, could you give me, could you please ask me the question related to each uh, uh, Japan's role or India-Japan relation in the quad? So indeed, the Ms. Roy has already explained the Prime Minister Shinzo Abe's address in the Indian Parliament in 2007 is one of the turning point of the India-Japan relation and the Quad. Indeed, Japan was a pioneer of the idea of the Quad. That address was very important to introduce idea, even if he did not use the word Quad or Indo-Pacific in that address. The contents of the Quad and Indo-Pacific is included in his address that time. But why? Does Japan need the Quad or Indo-Pacific in that places? So that's why I'm focusing on four questions today. First one is, what is the Quad significance for Japan? And why was the Quad formed? And how does the Quad work? And finally, what is the Japan's role in the Quad, I will explain. So what is the quad significance for Japan? In this uh, important feature of the Prime Minister Shinzo Abe's speech in 2007 was uh, he introduced both concepts in the Pacific and the quad at the same time. Because of both Pacific and Indian Ocean in one concept, uh, replacing the concept of the Asia Pacific. So in the Pacific is better than the Asia Pacific, he think. So, and the Asia Pacific, which did not include Indian Ocean region. That is a feature. First reason is because of the rapid economic development. The both Pacific side and Indian Ocean region are increasing emerging as an influential region in the world politics. So that is uh, when we talk about, that is very important because when we talk about uh, where is the center of the world politics in the past, in the World War I, World War II, why we say that? Because a big war has happened in Europe. That's why people say, because this influence will spread to the world and this is World War I and World War II. But now the, because of the economic development, this Indo-Pacific is also important in the world politics. That's why we need a new concept, including both Pacific and the Indian Ocean region. That's the first risk. But uh, this Indo-Pacific has a risk. What is the risk? This is the second risk. The rising Indo-Pacific region has been the under threat. Abe believe that it should not be the China-dominated region. That's why we need the Indo-Pacific. That's why we need a quad. When we check the Quad, we can understand one feature. Quad includes all great powers except China in the Indo-Pacific, of course. So Quad is needed to deal with China. That is the second feature. And the third feature is Prime Minister Abe want to emphasize the importance of India. Why India? Because uh, we can see, uh, we can see it. Uh, Compare with Asia Pacific, which region, well, which country is not included? Of course, India. About the Quad, if the Japan cooperate with the US and Australia, there is no new concept because Japan and the USRI, Australia and the USRI, there are plenty of chance to cooperate. But uh, uh, Japan was a pioneer of the Quad because India is a newcomer. We need India, that's why Quad is needed. So indeed, Japan emphasis the Quad means that Japan needs India. That is a third feature. So rising region and the, to deal with China, to prevent China dominated region. And uh, to do this, we need India. That's, uh, 
who attend the Indo-Pacific. That kind of idea uh, introduced by Prime Minister Abe, and that is uh, formed by the Japan's new policy toward India. So this quad is very important. So, but why Japan for so focusing on the Indo-Pacific and the Quad? Uh, and why Japan focusing on India? Indeed, uh, be from the security situation, China's activity has escalated in this region. That is the uh, main concern for Japan, main security concern for Japan to promote uh, this relation. Indeed, uh, see around Japan, you can see this map. China's activity has expanded. You can see the red route. China's naval ship or the Air Force bombers using this road again and again. This means that the circling Japan or the, when the, we check the defense line of China, the, the, there is a two line in this map, first island chain and second island chain. And China's military activity has expanding from the line of the, within the first island chain to the second island chain. And recently, the, we start to use the third island chain, uh, including the South Pacific. So China is expanding the area of military activity or frequency of the military activity around Japan. That is our first reason. Japan needs to deal with China. Japan needs a strategy to deal with China. In this case, the Quad in the Pacific, this is with uh, image in Japan's concept. The other thing, and then the, for example, the, this is the uh, frequency. The number of China's vessels identified within the contiguous zone in the waters surrounding the Senkaku Island of Japan. Uh, indeed, in the past, just 12, but now more than 1,000. Frequency has drastically increased. So Chinese B-cell are pushing Japan to do something. That is a situation. And uh, indeed, uh, around the Taiwan, you can, uh, I can uh, return to the map again. You can see the Taiwan is located between Japan and the uh, Philippines and in front of the China's main coastal cities. Indeed, around Taiwan, China also uh, escalates their military activities, especially the China's activity in the Pacific side of Taiwan as a concern for Japan. And because uh, if the China permanently uh, stay in the uh, Pacific side of Taiwan, it is impossible for Japan or United States to support Taiwan if China invade Taiwan. So, China's activity in the Pacific side of Taiwan is concern for Japan, and that's why Japan needs to deal with, with China. Indeed, between Japan and Taiwan, uh, you can see the main line of Japan is the more northern, northeastern side of the, this map. But indeed, Japan is a country of the chain of islands. And one of the islands, the western edge of the islands, just located 100 kilometers from the Taiwan, so just side of it. So indeed, the Taiwan and Japan is very near. When we check the China's activity, China's uh, scouting activity, indeed there are the three features. That's why the how to deal with indicated by these three features. The first feature of the note is China's repeatedly disregard of the current international law. Uh, for example, the, in the East China Sea, the sea around Senkaku Island of Japan, China did not claim the Senkaku Island before 1971. This attitude has changed uh, the, in, in 1971, uh, when the Senkaku Island had uh, 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 in two, uh, not, sorry, in the two, 1971, the China find China find uh, some information. Uh, there is a resources, uh, the sea around the Senkaku Island, uh, but at the same time, the Senkaku Island in the strategic location to pressure Taiwan. Uh, 
and have, uh, of course, uh, these resources is oil reserves that China needs because they are developing very fast economically and they need uh, more resources to develop. So that's why the uh, resources or the strategic location, these are the reason China changed the attitude towards Senkaku Island. But in this case, before the 1971, China did not claim the Senkaku Island as their island. This means that re uh, when we check the legal background of the China's claim, China ignore uh the international law and start to claim the east area as their territory so be from this situation uh, china is ignoring the current international law the rule-based order and this feature is the same in the south china sea or in the china border area indeed that's why this is one of the feature of the china's claim china is expanding claim and uh, and ignoring the uh, rule-based order Second feature is the China's territorial expansion is timing. Timing. What kind of timing? Indeed, China is exploit, exploit the situation whenever it finds the power vacuum. For example, in the South China Sea, South China Sea, in 1950s, China occupied half of the Paracel Island. Just after France withdraw the Indochina Peninsula, including Vietnam, Cambodia, Laos, this area. Uh, so when, so when they find the military balance has changed and the power vacuum they found, they try to take. That is a pattern in 1950s, but this pattern has repeated uh, in 1970s. When US withdraw from Vietnam, China occupied another half of the Paracel Island. In 1980s, when Soviet troops reduced the number in Vietnam, China occupied the Spiratory Island, indeed the sixth feature of the Spiratory Islands. And uh, in 1990s, when US withdraw from Philippines, China occupied the mischief reef. So every time they find a power vacuum created by the changing military balance, they steal it. So uh, we can compare the Russia and China. The Russia's military operation uh, is uh, when they find a chance they use the military, it looks like they are bagger. But uh, compared with Russia, China is thief. China is thief. We'll find that someone uh, do not take, uh, they try to steal it. That is the pattern of China's uh, territory expansion. So now why China is expanding their territory? Indeed, uh, last, uh, last decade, according to CIPRI, the think tank in Sweden, the, they calculate the military expenditure. The last decade, 2011 to 2020, the China increased their military expenditure 76%. Compared with the 76%, US decreased 10%. Decreased their military expenditure 10%. And another country, for example, the also uh, uh, India, also, India increased 34%, and Australia 33%. Japan increased only 2.4%. But that kind of the situation create one kind of the power vacuum, China can exploit it. So China is expanding their territory in many sides of the China. For example, the comparison of the China's activity in the Sierra and Senkaku Island, you can see this map, but uh, you, you can see the same feature in the India-China border. The, this is the number of the China's incursion in the India-China border. In 2011, to, uh, to nearly 200, 230 times, China tried to enter the Indian side of the India-China border, but now 663. So that's why I, I overlap the two figures, the uh, China's activity here around Senkak and the China's incursion in the India-China border area. Look at this. You can see 2012 and 2090, um, China increased the number. And indeed, from the 2011 to 2090, yes, China is increasing their number. They escalate the situation. So they are finding the power vacuum. Because of the military balance has changed, they are exploiting it. That's the second feature of the China's military activity. And the third one is indeed the China's military activities combined with uh, military and non-military. 
So non-military area is also important when we check the China's activity. For example, the infrastructure project. Infrastructure project, China create a huge debt for, uh, to take the uh, Hanban to the port in uh, Sri Lanka. Because the uh, China's interest rate is very high. And uh, when the Sri Lanka understand they cannot pay, uh, China did not extend the deadline. So uh, instead of this, China takes uh, right of control of the Hanban to the port for 99 years. And in Chinese, 99 years means that forever. In the other language different, but 99 years in Chinese means that forever. So that's why this is very serious and important. Uh, China's infrastructure project is not a kind project. This is, uh, uh, this is a project only for China. And the uh, economic control is also, because the country depends on the China's market too heavily, when some things happen, China can impose economic sanction against other country to expand their uh, influence and uh, territory. Uh, that is a method China has done in many places. One of the example is a recent example is uh, uh, when the COVID-19 pandemic has happened, Australia asked the international community community to international investigation of the origin of the COVID-19. That time, China tried to delay the, to import Australian products like the wine, uh, the, or the lobsters, uh, as an economic sanction. Of course, this is not a legal economic sanction, but uh, China tried to harass it because Australia depends on Chinese market. That is China's influence. So this uh, third feature is supporting role to expand China's influence. So firstly, uh, China. So first feature is uh, China ignored current international law. Second feature is using the power vacuum militarily. And thirdly, the non-military purpose is supporting law to uh, expand their military influence. So, when we see so this kind of the China's expansion, what should we do? Will be the matter. In this case, how does the Quad work? Will be the question. So, my simple answer is, we should do the opposite what China wants. That's the answer. So, third feature, if there is, a, no, no, three features, if there is a three features, all of three, we need to push back. Firstly, is uh, respecting rule-based order. Is, uh, of course, we should do. Because China tried to change the status quo by force and continually challenge international norm. If so, we should respect the rule, uh, current international law. For example, repeatedly we express how important the rule based order, how important international law, how important the current international regime, because this is a rule we set up together. If China wants to change, if China wants, China should negotiate with others and should, so through the negotiation and as a peaceful means, uh, China can change the rule, but without this, China cannot ignore the, this rule-based order. That is the attitude we should respect. That is the first one. And secondly, of course, uh, creating power vacuum is a problem. If so, we should maintain military balance and do not create a power vacuum. Uh, in this case, uh, we need to set up the new security system. Indeed, uh, this, uh, you can see that this uh, slide, there are two kinds of security system. First one is hub and spoke. Indeed, for a long time, the United States side uh, used a hub and spoke system to maintain order in the Indo-Pacific. In this system, you can, uh, in this system, the hub and spoke, the US is hub and spoke is Japan, Australia, or other US allies. 
Feature of the, this system is all information go to the United States. And if something happens, US will deal with all problems. So this system heavily depends on the United States. For example, the US and Japan is a lie, former lie. US and Australia is also a lie. But Japan and Australia is not a lie. So that's why all the information goes to the United States. And if something problem has, has happened, US will deal with that is the system. So this is US read US control system. This system has worked for a long time. That's true. Because uh, in this case, if there is a problem between Japan and Australia, this is not a problem because uh, this is uh, not related. US can deal with. But current situation, you have already known. The, uh, China increased their military expenditure the 76 percent uh, in the decade, and the US decreased 10 percent. In this case, if the system heavily depending on only the United States, system itself uh, will decline along with the declining with the United States. Of course, if US uh, rise their power, of course this system will work. But uh, compared with China's rise. Uh, uh, US has already developed and not uh, easy to develop so fast pace. China can catch up. In this case, we need a new system, and the US also thinks so. That is a network based system. In this system, more democratic security system is uh, created, and currently, we, uh, we are indeed this system has really establishing, I think. For example, the Japan and the US, Australia and the US, of course, cooperate, but at the same time, Japan and Australia also cooperate. And of course, newcomer, India. India and Japan cooperate. India and Australia cooperate. In some cases, as a trilateral based negotiation, India, Japan, Australia, the trilateral cooperation is also exist. In this case, even if the United States is not included, United States say it is welcome because this kind of system is a new system to share security burden to maintain order in the region. Because of this, we can see it's many trilateral, quadrilateral, uh, or uh, bilateral, trilateral, quadrilateral, or other, other multilateral uh, security cooperation um, in this region. For example, the AUKUS, along with the Quad, AUKUS is there. And another one is India, Indonesia, France. What kind of the trilateral? This is new. But uh, these countries uh, share the same interest to maintain rule-based order or maintain the military balance. That is the reason the culmination of the, this bilateral, trilateral, uh, quadrilateral, or other minilateral cooperation, we can make the network of this cooperation and sharing security burden with the United States and uh, maintain peace and stability in this region. That's why this new system could work. So, but uh, how to work is uh, we need to, uh, we need to uh, identify more deeply. Indeed, this kind, in this, in this system, quad, it's a very important to make important system, to important uh, co co minilateral cooperation uh, to maintain military balance with China. Because uh, you can imagine, if you as a Chinese leader to decide to which area you can spend the budget, military expansion in this case, if the India and Japan cooperate each other, China need to share the, some certain budget against India, but uh, if uh, China spends certain amount of the budget against India, China cannot spend the same amount of budget against Japan. Uh, at least the same, uh, same budget uh, cannot use in uh, two places at the same time. So if India and Japan cooperate, China need to divide their budget in two sides. If Australia, US, or Southeast Asian countries, or other uh, uh, 
uh, like-minded countries, cooperate each other. China need to share, uh, China need to divide their budget in many directions. That's why to maintain military balance, this cooperation could work. And uh, if uh, these, all of this country has offensive capability against China, of course uh, it could, uh, it, it will be the effective because uh, if uh, Japan possesses strike capability, India possesses strike capability, in this case, uh, China need to share, share the, some budget for the, not only the offense, but also the defense and many direction at the same time, many fronts at the same time. In this case, to maintain military balance, more easy to maintain. That's why the strike capability is key. For example, recently, the Japan tried to extend the range of missiles or bombs, but this is not only Japan indeed. Australia also tried to possess strike capability now. This is a list of missiles. And of course, India. India originally, of course, possessed uh, nuclear weapon and long range missiles, but currently, the, as a conventional weapon, India also developing many missiles against China and extending range. Indeed, all of these has happened at the same time. If all of the Quad country possess the strike capability, China need to cons China need to share more budget to defend their country in a multi direction and maintaining military balance, it is effective way to deal with. That's why currently all of the Quad country focusing on the strike capability. And thirdly, uh, of course, uh, China use a non-military policy as an overall strategy. So integrate military and non-military policy as a, as a one overall strategy is uh, what Quad should do. Of course, uh, and indeed, uh, when we check uh, China's threat, China's threat, what is the problem? Indeed, China is rich. That is a problem. Why? Because uh, rapid military modernization creates uh, uh, create, uh, changing military uh, balance and uh, create a uh, power vacuum. Such kind of discussion depend on China's ample budget. The Belt and Road Initiative, the infrastructure project, create a huge depot uh, recipient and control the recipient. That kind of uh, uh, infrastructure project depends on China's ample budget. Without ample budget, China cannot do anything. So this means that economic aspect of the China threat is very important part of uh, China threat. So, for example, the, uh, recently, the, there is a new economic framework, the Indo-Pacific economic framework. Well, in the past, we talk about TPP, uh, Trans-Pacific Partnership. Why? These are the very important way to deal with China because they try to create alternative market with China, simply reducing income of China. So how to deal with China? We need to integrate military and non-military to deal with it. That's a very important. Recently, the economic security is also important. Do not depend on supply chain on China or the, at least uh, diversifying the risk. And decoupling was a very uh, popular word during the Trump administration in the United States, and now still people use this word because try to uh, try to reduce the China's income or try to uh, escape from the Chinese market. If the U.S. try to impose a strong economic sanction against China to reduce the China's income, in this case, the other country should not depend on Chinese market. That's why the decoupling is effective way. So if Quad country can create the Indo-Pacific economic framework, and indeed this Indo-Pacific economic framework, including all of the Quad countries, and it is first time, 
the all quad country agree to establish something, uh, the economic uh, framework. So that is a part of the quad project. Even if the quad meeting, they do not talk, but uh, indeed, uh, uh, same prices in Tokyo, they agreed this month. So what is Japan's role? It's uh, from now, I should explain. And I have already, Mm, I have already uh, spent much time, but uh, maybe I'll continue uh, and I should uh, end the short, uh, this one, or it's a short time. But, uh, okay, firstly, respecting rules-based order. It's uh, very important. And in case of Japan, for example, the June 2070, August 2021, uh, Japan, uh, repeatedly, three, repeatedly three, express their support to India is one of the way to the respecting rules based order. In 2070 or 2021, uh, 20, what happened? First one is Dokram incident. Second one is Garwan incident. Every time China, India faced uh, threat of China, that time, that time Japanese ambassador to India expressed uh, uh, we will not, we will not support, uh, we will not support uh, uh, changing the status quo by force. Uh, this statement is uh, clearly indicate in the China in this case, because now uh, India hasn't tried to change the status quo by force. This is supporting, uh, supporting the remarks. But well, recent uh, Russia's invasion against uh, Ukraine is um, clearly violated this situation. That's why the, that kind of the statement is looks weak view from now. But that age, this kind of the remark is relatively strong. That kind of uh, public statement is relatively strong. And Japan was the first one to support India in the 2007. And uh, so, how important rules-based order, or how to uh, punish the if the country violates this, is uh, important to maintain the rules-based order. Now, that's why the, this is very important, and uh, Japan is seeking this, and maintaining military balance. Maintaining military balance is also important part. Uh, you have already seen the, uh, Japan try to possess uh, limited strike capability, even if the Japan's defense policy is defensive defense. It is new change. This year, Japan will publish a new uh, national security strategy, which is the most important uh, strategic document. And the last one was the 2030. So Japan need to, anyway, Japan need to publish new one because 2030 is too old. But at the same time, but at the same time, in this document, uh, Japan clearly, uh, in, clearly indicate we will possess the strike capability. That is a very big change because uh, from the last 70 years, Japan tried to maintain the defensive defense strategy as a defense strategy. But this time, this is offensive defense. So of course, uh, this is limited strike capability, just a supporting role for the defensive defense strategy. But if Japan has a strike capability, China need to deal with it. That's why this is a very important change. And uh, uh, the role of the strike capability, I have already explained it uh, when I explained the quad. But uh, at the same time, uh, Japan will increase the collaboration with uh, other ally, including India. It's, for example, the, in case of the India-Japan cooperation, uh, in the Japan's uh, cooperation with India or Japan cooperation with the partner in the Indian Ocean region indicated uh, by the one uh, Indicate one example. Indeed, the area of the Japan's maritime self-defense force has area of the activity of the Japan maritime self-defense force has expanded, especially in the Indian Ocean. Since 2001, the Japan has deployed the 
Japanese Maritime Safety Defense Force to support US operation in Afghanistan or other anti piracy measures. Uh, but uh, indeed, uh, this kind of activity is not only the cooperation with the US alone. Because uh, US operation against Afghanistan, uh, yeah, in Afghanistan against Taliban uh, is a, a coalition movement with uh, other coalition partners. So Japan also collaborate with them for the refrain, if well, to the worship of the, this country. Anti piracy measures in the coast of Somalia is the same. The other country in the both Europe and Asia gathered in that places and uh, uh, they conducted anti piracy measures collaboratively. In this case, Japan collaborates with these worship uh, countries uh, directly in the coast of Somalia. In the, for a long time, Japan intended to uh, did not create the, Japan tried to try to uh, but simply said last 70 years United States is only partner for Japan only ally for Japan because if Japan cooperate with other country uh, because of the countries around Japan was well, uh, United States worry about uh, Japan's future or Japan's potential as, as a rival against uh, against the United States uh it will create something the risk for japan so japan intentionally do not cooperate with other country is uh, uh, policy what's the policy but uh, when japan ex uh, cooperate with the united states in the indian ocean automatically japan need to cooperate with the coalition partners and uh, one by one the Japan's uh, uh, cooperation has expanding since 2001. And uh, when the Japanese naval ship need to go to Indian Ocean, they need to go through the East China Sea, South China Sea, and the uh, Bay of Bengal or the uh, Arabian Sea. So at uh, that time, the, these warships uh, called at the port in many countries, including uh, uh, ASEAN countries or uh, the Sri Lanka, the South uh, Asian countries or Middle East also. So Japan is expanding, promoting the defense cooperation with these countries. So Japan's deployment in the Indian Ocean indicates that Japan is expanding their cooperation with other countries. That is a new, quite new security policy for Japan. And every year this is promoting. And Russia's aggression to Ukraine gave, uh, pushed Japan to do more, especially the Japan decided to uh, donate uh, the non lethal weapons to the Ukraine. And uh, this is a new, new move because uh, even if the non lethal weapons, uh, for a long time, Japan hesitated to export arms to the other countries, especially the countries is under the uh, conflict. So, but uh, this has really happened now. This means that Japan can do the same to the other country like Taiwan or the Southeast Asia or India. If something has happened in the Japan's field, this is interest of Japan. So this is uh, Japan has expanding the area of the activity, not only the geographical area, but also method itself. And uh, of course, uh, by using this uh, donating weapon, exporting weapon, Japan is enhancing defense capability of the regional countries, especially the Southeast Asia. Now, the Vietnam, Philippines, Indonesia, Malaysia, Sri Lanka received uh, Japan's weapon. And uh, indeed, with Indi 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 India, India to train uh, defense force in these countries. Uh, for example, the Vietnam, the Malaysia, the, their air force depend on the training of the Indian Air Force. Or the, so that's why, that's why the, indeed uh, this is also the cooperation with, between India and Japan. Uh, by, they have done bilaterally, but uh, purpose is same, I think. So 
This is also the Japan's role to maintain military balance with China. Japan enhanced the capability. At the same time, Japan tried to enhance the capability of the other country and, uh, by co and enhance the cooperation with Japan and the other country, uh, many other countries. Uh, that is a new trend to maintain military balance in this region. And third one is non-military co uh, contribution. Of course, a non-military cooperation, Japan has been relatively uh, big, Japan takes a relatively big role uh, because the infrastructure project or uh, especially the collaboration with India, Japan is, uh, Japan has started uh, an infrastructure project in Andaman Nicobar Island for the side of the Maraca Strait. Uh, this is a route for China to deploy the submarine from China, uh, from Hainan Island. So they need to cross the uh, choke point of the Indonesia. The, of course, some choices they have, but the Maraca Strait is an important route anyway. Mm -hmm. And in this case, uh, how to detect the submarine, the Andaman Nicobar Island is very important. But Andaman Nicobar is far from the mainland of the India. For, for example, how to create internet access, how to make the power plant, uh, everything is needed in the Andaman Nicobar Island. In this case, Japan has a, uh, uh, technology and the infrastructure project, Japan really uh, create a net internet network be connecting the Andaman Nicobar Island and India's mainland by connecting the uh, right fever uh, connection and create now the power plant is also. So even if uh, this uh, the civil purpose, the Japan's infrastructure project try to uh, try to neutralize the China's influence, for example, in case of Bangladesh. So when the China suggests the Sonadia port project in Chittagong, uh, near Chittagong, uh, Japan suggests the Matabari port project near Chittagong too. And uh, finally, Bangladesh accepts the uh, Matabari port project uh, instead of the Sonadia port project of China. Uh, that because uh, this kind of alternative project is very important for recipients, why Sri Lanka accept the Hanban Tota port project? Uh, because there was no alternate project that time. This was uh, one of the reasons at least. So that's why the alternative, suggesting alternative project is very important. And in this case, uh, India and Japan collaborate each other because uh, indeed South Asia is India's area. And uh, so when Japan has done, Japan collaborate with India indeed. So this kind of uh, 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 military and non-military collaboration is also Japan's policy to, uh, in, uh, to, to neutralize China's influence. And in this case, uh, Japan collaborated with India recently, the Asia, Africa Economic Corridor, or Indo-Pacific region, or Blue Dot Network. So every time, uh, in the case by case basis, the India and Japan collaborate indeed. And uh, indeed, uh, Final one is how to decouple with China will be very important as a non-military boom. Uh, indeed, uh, it, is, it is very difficult to decouple with China immediately indeed, but if the US will impose a strong sanction against China, uh, we, need, we need to escape from Chinese market because without this, our economy will be a passenger of the sinking ship. But uh, when we check the uh, when we check the uh, number of the Japanese living in China, indeed, uh, this has decreased very drastically, nearly twenty eight percent since the two thousand twelve. So Japan tried to reduce this one, and indeed, uh, in case of India, India also the worry about this situation. Uh, because the uh, US China competition escalated. And uh, indeed, uh, in this case, as an alternative market, India is most important. So if uh, Japan escape from China, the Japan need to relocate their factories from China to other country. And in this case, India is main destination. So that is the reason to, to deal with China is, uh, uh, India and Japan, and chances for the India-Japan collaboration, and it is really happening now. So but I should conclude my presentation, a little long one hour presentation, not one hour, but uh, we talked uh, some minutes, uh, but uh, nearly. 
but uh, Japan introduced the idea of the Quad and Indo-Pacific because uh, Japan, uh, because of the three reasons, and one of the reasons is Japan focusing on India. That's why this is a topic of the India-Japan relation. But uh, because of this, because of this reason is related to the security, that's why the security relation has developed well. And in this case, as a quad, three point is very important because of the feature of the three feature of the China's territory expansion, as uh, ignoring the rule based order, and uh, uh, they uh, exploit the power vacuum based on the military balance, and uh, uh, they co collaborate with the military and non military. That's why the India, Japan, and especially the Japan's policy toward in this region. Uh, focusing on these three areas, the rule based order, or the, uh, maintaining military balance, or the, uh, how to collaborate uh, military and non military. And uh, in this case, uh, India Japan collaboration, the progress is each one. So if the uh, rule based order, so both India and Japan, the other joint statement, every time we can find these words uh, in the Quad meeting, or bilateral uh, summit, or uh, any other, it's every time the same. Uh, and uh, if the India face uh, border, uh, India face crisis in the India-China border, uh, of course Japan try to support India as a political statement, and uh, uh, the maintain military balance, uh, collaboration create China uh, create a situation China need to divide their defense budget in at least two direction, and uh, military and non-military collaboration, the infrastructure project or uh, what. Uh, creating the new market like IPEF, uh, Indo-Pacific Economic Framework, India, Japan has collaborate. That is the current situation. So now also, what is the problem is uh, we, we need to promote more is the uh, matter for us. And uh, now is the time to do that. That's my presentation, a little long, but thank you very much for listening. Should I um, do something? No, no, thank you so much, uh, uh, Sensei. Thank you so much for this wonderful presentation. And um, I guess uh, I have two questions and then we'll open the floor for questions. And we've already told all the participants to um, type out their uh, questions in the chat box. Ryan Yukti will be reading out the questions for you. Uh, let me start with my question. Um, so this is on something which you would really like. This is on defense relations. So uh, the question that I'm asking you is, we are seeing an upward movement in the defense relations re between India and Japan. Japan has been finding ways to increase and reestablish itself as a defense power globally. Uh, today, especially keeping in mind China's behavior, how does Japan plan to increase its self-defense forces with regard to the issue that Japan is facing a steadily declining population? And uh, what do you think would be Japan's plan to move ahead? And can India do anything to help Japan in this domain? That's my first question. Um, with regard to my second question, uh, the question is on the Senkaku Islands and the Kuriling Islands. So the Senkaku Islands and the Kuril Islands, Japan is inevitably facing a two-front aggression from its neighbors. Do you feel uh, Japan will be garnering support from the Quad members? Also, if you think uh, Japan will be garnering support from the Quad members, how can India help Japan in the Senkaku Islands and the Kuril Islands disputes? Uh, these are the first two questions from me, and then I'm sure Ryan and Yukti will be taking it forward. Okay. So, uh, you are moderator in this case, I understand. So that's why uh, uh, this is a privilege of the moderator, I understand. Okay, first one is, uh, yes, uh, Japan is decline, uh, declining because of the population is declining. That uh, kind of uh, discussion is indeed true. But uh, at the same time, uh, small population do not mean the small national power. If we succeed to uh, use robot, uh, indeed, how to deal with the aging society is a big matter in Japan. And uh, in case of the in case of the supply of the soldiers, indeed, this is a big matter. Indeed, for university teachers, how to get the student is also matter. But for the armed forces, how to get the soldiers is a big matter. So, but uh, yes, it is impossible. For example, the, uh, for example, the uh, Japan Maritime Self-Defense Force, which is Navy. Navy, uh, 
uh, need to deploy as a soldier in the Indian Ocean region. This is far, this is far from Japan, but they have families. They want to return to Japan. How to do it? That's big problem currently. But uh, if so, uh, simply said, we need to reduce the work itself if they find, but at the same time, we need to reduce the number of the crew of the each warship is another answer. And uh, recently, the Japan started to change to accept the many ladies to the armed forces because uh, indeed, this is uh, well related with, uh, of course, uh, rising the social status of the ladies, but at the same time, uh, number is shrinked. That's also the fact. So my, when we talk with the self-defense force, they think Japan can deal with this problem at least the next decade or two decades. If we accept uh, some, uh, ladies uh, or more elderly soldiers and the robots, uh, they said. But uh, in the future, it will, it will be the more serious problem. And that time, uh, uh, what should we do will be the matter. There is a possibility Japan will accept uh, uh, Hogi nationals as a mercenaries like France. Uh, of course, uh, that. Uh, it will be the one of the option. What well, some of the experts pointed out, uh, we also use the private military companies to deal with this. That's also another option. But uh, it will happen, uh, I think, but not just now. It's the current situation. And another one is Japan is facing many threats at the same time. Can Japan contribute to the quad is a question. Because Russia is now a threat, North Korea is a threat, and China is a threat. And Japan needs to support Taiwan. Japan needs to support, Japan needs to take the some heavy role. Japan needs to take, Japan needs to take, Japan needs to take. That kind of situation. Can Japan contribute to the quad well? It's a matter. That's true. But at the same time, in the automatically, uh, Japan can contribute to this situation because uh, Japan decided to increase their defense budget nearly double. The currently, uh, uh, Japan's defense budget is 1.4% uh, of the GDP. Uh, it depends on the how to calculate, but uh, so politically, Japanese government for a long time, Japanese government say uh, our defense budget is less than the one percent of the GDP. But uh, when the calculation is based on the NATO type, the one point four is uh, one point four percent. Japan's defense budget has already entered in this area. But uh, Japan will increase this one point four percent of the GDP of the uh, GDP to the 2% of the GDP. Uh, defense, Japan's defense budget will increase, increase drastically from 1.4% uh, of GDP to 2%. Uh, in the, in the, uh, I think so within five years, that is one of the goals, Japan will say. So that's why the, we face a problem that's true, but uh, we try to catch up, is that's also true. So, my China is increasing their military expenditure. Russia is increasing military expenditure. North Korea is increasing. North Korea is one kind of the crazy rebel in it to, uh, because uh, indeed the uh, number of the soldiers in the every 1,000 population, the North Korea is uh, nearly 70 or 80, uh, three times bigger than the, uh, two times bigger than the Israel, uh, quite crazy rebel. But uh, my anyway, uh, so what I want to say is North Korea is a quite militarized country. So that's why the, all these three at the same time is very serious. But at the same time, Japan tried to catch up that through. Sorry, mm -hmm. I should not uh, explain the so long because uh, and, uh, no one can ask the question if I talk so more than that. Thank you. I just, I just have a counter question to the first thing, the first question that you said that uh, you will be taking in, taking in France. Do you think there is a possibility, like Israel has compulsory military training for its citizens? Do you think there is a possibility Japan could also have that in the future? That's one. Secondly, do you think, uh, like you said about robotics, how do you plan to deal with robotics? I mean, because we've been seeing like how Japan is a land of robots. So, 
Okay, about the first one, uh, civil military organization, uh, uh, should Japan establish? Yes, should Japan should establish, of course, but at the same time, it is impossible the, under the current mood. Of course, Russia's aggression to Ukraine changed the mood in Japan, that's true. Japanese start to understand we need to increase the defense budget. But at the same time, still, this war is on the screen. Japan is an island nation. Island nation means all of the enemy we cannot see. We can when we see the border, this is the sea. Fish, we can see the fish, not the human. So there is no threat. In this case, what how to rise the mood to defend our country or the how to make the how to persuade the people to accept the civil military effort? It is nearly impossible. And last 70 years, the government tried to try to change the mindset of the Japanese. The national security is issue is not so important for you. You should work as a businessman. In this case, uh, we need government need to change now, need to change these people to be the warrior, but a very big gap is exist. So civil military effort is not easy to establish. But, but, uh, but at the same time, Japan society itself is well organized. That's why once something ha happened, Japan will move. Japanese are moving very as a one organization indeed. That is different because repeatedly earthquake has come and we, we are building with staff because of the earthquake, our building with staff because of the typhoon, and repeatedly we fortify our countries, our towns. So bomb has come, this is a different situation. Missile has come, different situation with typhoon and earthquake. But uh, maintaining organization, society has already changed. Already, uh, not changed, um, already trained. That's why if Japan is weak, other countries think, that's not true. Japanese are what looks like the uh, organization. And they work uh, as a team very well, I think. This is one kind of feature of the, this island nation. About the robotics. Robotics, uh, we can find many robotics in, the, uh, in your life. For example, the, one of the example is a smartphone. Now we can connect with the internet anytime. So knowledge is not a matter. We can check the smartphone and find the knowledge. This is one kind of the robotics. It looks like the teacher is teaching just side of your pocket. Or you can find smartphone, like that, something like that. So world has changed along with this equipment anytime. And everything is robotics. So when we call this robot, it looks like uh, maybe it's a supporting robot like the Star Wars or something. Uh, um, but this, this is not only the robot. Every machine are robot. So it, it, is impo it is possible. What kind of image? For example, the number of the crew to control the was one warship was 100, now 50. This is robotics. By using this system, we can use the number of the people we need to work the society or work the military organization. That could happen because automatically that could that will happen, but we need to accelerate this move. That is a uh, situation Japan is facing. And in case of India, India has a plenty of the human resources. In this case, no need to hurry. In, in case of India, India should develop their robots themselves, but uh, indeed, demand in the society is a little minimum. So, well, just uh, in, in case of India, India needs a robot to enhance the capability. In case of Japan, Japan needs a robot to fill the gap of the declining population. <laughs> created by the Korean population. That's a difference, uh, but uh, yes, uh, that is more serious in Japan. Okay, I should uh, reply to other questions. Uh... And you could go ahead, Yukti, you could go ahead with the questions, please. Yes, I will do that. Thank you, ma'am. Um, thank you so much for the presentation, Dr. Nagao.
So the first question that we have from the question Q&A box is by Dhanishri. And she's asking that since the Indo-Pacific region has gained significant attention and the role of Quad has been highlighted repeatedly, uh, what role do the small island nations play for Quad as, as a whole and for Japan specifically? Especially, is, uh, is this a talk about South Pacific? Yes, sir, South Pacific and also the other yeah. Indeed, the South Pacific is the area Japan was occupied in the past, that's true, and we know this area very well. But uh, at the same time, when Japan, uh, Japan expands influence that uh, South Pacific, the relation with Australia has deteriorated very fast, and the uh, uh, relation with the United States deteriorated very fast, and that was one of the uh, uh, one of the reasons uh, US and Australia and Japan enter the World War II. So this area is very sensitive area for Japan. So after the World War II, Japan tried to support them because of the people-people connection. In this many, uh, many island people are Japan-oriented now uh, uh, during uh, Japan's occupation in this area and the human-human connection is very deep. For example, the president uh, Nakamura has uh, happened in, uh, Nakamura was the president in the Parao, but this name of Nakamura is Japanese family name. So indeed, a very strong connection with them. So that's why the, even if the, after the World War II, Japan tried to support this island economically. Uh, and uh, Australia allowed Japan to do that, and in this case, very cordial relation with them. Now China tried to intervene in this area, and uh, because this is uh, one kind of the repeated history, but uh, Japan and China have changed. Japan is the Australian side, and China tried to uh, enter, looks like an empire of Japan. <laughs> so that's why. Uh, that's why the Japan collaborated with Australia to support this island. That's true. at the same time, view from Japan, indeed, this is suicide for Chinese. Because uh, if the China expand influence the South Pacific, it will create a very uh, serious situation for the US and Australia, and quad cooperation will strange because of the motivation lies in the US and Australia. So if so, the view from Japan, yes, Japan can support this uh, island, but at the same time, Japan do not need, do not need to uh, neutralize the China's influence so strongly in the South Pacific. Because the more the China expands the influence, the more the US and Australia come to support Japan. So of course, uh, Japan will do, uh, Japan will contribute to support Australia's role in this region. But indeed, uh, this is beneficial for Japan in, in strategically. Okay, thank you so much for that uh, answering that question. Uh, the next questions that uh, do you mind, uh, Doctor, that I uh, say the questions one by one and then you can answer them together, or do you want me to say one question at a time? Yeah, as you wish. Okay. So, um, Professor Jha has asked three questions. So, we'll just take them at first and then I'll uh, read out the rest of the questions. So, the first question that he asks is Which areas in critical technologies does Japan feel that could lead to quad partnership and feasible solutions? Um, the second question, sir, is asking is uh, What is your opinion about formation of quad eyes network? Uh, is it similar to five eyes network? And the last question is, India has recently signed logistic support agreement with Vietnam. Um, do you think that a trilateral uh, re a relation between India, Vietnam, and Japan is, is actually feasible? Uh, yes, uh, about the critical technology. Yes, uh, which area is a priority itself is a topic of the how to deal with the critical technology or supply chain of the critical technology. Because uh, when we start talk about the critical technology, Japan understand that we did not know what happened in Japan. Because one word, critical technology, how critical, we need to define. The technology itself, 
uh, when we check the technology, everything is technology. For example, the one, only one small part is technology, but big parts is also technology. And uh, but big parts, including the small parts, of course. So which one is critical? When we talk about big one, of course, the big one is critical. But big one includes the small one means that all of the small one is critical too. So under such kind of situation, firstly we need to do it. Uh, uh, we need to check the supply chain, and we need to make the big list of the, our uh, techno list of technologies. That has uh, then this is nearly impossible. This it will create one kind of space. Even if the company who produced the big parts did not know uh, which parts came from which country, so so most critical part is of course latest military one. Latest military technology related with uh, the hypersonic missiles was uh, very important uh, uh, semiconductor related. This was a priority that people think that's true. But uh, indeed, in this case, a simple answer and uh, ambiguity answer is uh, anything important case by case basis. That is answer. So now was uh, Japan passed a view of the economic security and this uh, bill including a list of the critical technology. But once a company uh, developed a new technology, every time Japanese government will check it and set up this, this is a critical technology, do not publish it. Instead of this, we will give you the patent, as, but secret patent. Um, something like that. Uh, this new system has created under the, this law and try to protect the case by case basis. Second one, the, what kind of the quad is ideal quad? Uh, yes, uh, five eyes is more coherent because based on the former British Empire, the, these five countries cooperate in the secretary as a, for, a bunch of formal framework. This is five eyes sharing information, the five countries, the US, Canada, uh, Australia, and British, of course, and New Zealand. So and, uh, in the last year, of course, there was a discussion. Japan will join these five eyes as the six eyes. Uh, but uh, when we check the detail, it is impossible for Japan to join because uh, there is no to profit the spy in Japan. Uh, you can see the how different Japan is. For a long time, last 70 years, Japan tried to ignore the national security. So there is no law to prohibit spying. So some people say this is the heaven of spy because no, no reason to arrest them. So this means that if the five eyes country try to share the secret information with Japan and they identify the Russian spy or Chinese spy or North Korea spy, it takes this information from Japanese official, but there is no law to arrest them. So can the five eyes share the information with Japan? So indeed, Japan cannot be the part of five eyes. So when we talk about quads, same situation has happened. Of course, uh, Japan can share the information with other country and uh, my J Japanese police try to exploit other law to arrest someone uh, who, to spy it. In this case, it is possible, but at the same time, this is not same level with the five eyes. So still quad is more strategic, but uh, not uh, deep like the military alliances or the sharing the information framework like uh, Five Eyes. Uh, quad is uh, dealing with more big issues and more the non-military issues uh, mainly. But the last quad summit, uh, people start to realize that Quad is changing to be the original quad because uh, they try to they try to mention the non-military uh, cooperation, uh, but uh, dual use cooperation. Dual use is most military and non-military. 
for example, the sharing the information of the maritime security or the sharing information of the satellite, even if there is a war, this is a civil purpose, or et cetera, et cetera. This kind of the cooperation is sharing the dual use information and this facility is self responsibility, take responsibility by the military organization in some in, in this uh, some of the countries. And at the same time, humanitarian assistance, disaster management is also mentioned. This kind of the humanitarian assistance and uh, disaster management implemented by the armed forces and they carry the product from the land to sea or sea to land to support or help the uh, victims of the, this disaster. This means that this, this is, looks like the military operation, even if there is no the fire in the missiles. So Quad start to expand the security area. It is obvious. So, and, uh, so this cooperation is still uh, not the military alliances, but security cooperation, it is clear, I think. And uh, about the trilateral cooperation between uh, India, Vietnam, and Japan, yes, that is possible, but uh, as a practical way, which one is more faster than the others, it's a matter in this case. Of course, uh, I think it sh we should create the trilateral cooperation mechanism in the India, in Vietnam, and Japan. But at the same time, uh, when the Vietnam talk with Vietnam receives something equipment from India or from Japan, in this uh, currently uh, they enjoy the bilateral basis uh, negotiation because uh, trilateral is more difficult to set up the day to meet or uh, than the bilateral, and trilateral is more difficult to arrange than the bilateral. That's why the bilateral is always uh, practical in some case, uh, or many cases. So that's why uh, we should create a trilateral cooperation, uh, but at the same time, uh, indeed, all of three countries love the bilateral, I think. <laughs> well, that's the current situation. So yes, idea itself is, uh, of course, uh, I all strongly support it. Indeed, politically, this message, trilateral message is good. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Nagao. Okay, so uh, there are some questions which are related to this. So I'm asking them first, and then we will move on to the last question that we have from Ryan. So Mehul is asking this question that, uh, in order to Japan for Japan to militarize, there has to be a change of the constitution itself because of the post-war legal structure that Japan has. What is the likelihood of that happening, like changing of the uh, legal structure and uh, scrapping off of Article 9, if I'm not mistaken? And has Japan fully committed itself to remilitarizing and acting as a regional counterweight to China? If not, is it likely to do so? And so uh, I had some follow-up questions to what you had answered. So recently, uh, North Korea in particular has been a major uh, you know, cyber attacker for Japan in particular. And I wanted to ask, in the domain of cybersecurity and also the outer space, we are seeing that there's like a recent um, you know, increase in the, in the kind of like a race between the countries and Japan is also participating in that. So what do you think Japan and also India will play a role in terms of these two uh, domains and how geopolitics will be impacted by these two areas, emerging areas, which is kind of like not comprehensible for a lot of people. Okay, the first question about the uh, amendment of the constitution. Yes, uh, that is a matter for a long time, but uh, this issue is related with the mood in Japan. Uh, because, uh, it, for example, the practical policy, as a practical policy, Japan has already changed the constitution many times, indeed. For example, the, when we read the constitution, original sentences of the constitution, uh, everyone understands this is this constitution prohibit to possess any armed forces. But Japan possesses a self-defense force. Why and how? Because Japan have already changed uh, uh, the perception towards uh, uh, or interpretation of the constitution. So 
If so, the changing the sentence of the constitution, is it meaningful or not? Indeed, uh, this is meaningful if the mood in Japan has changed. That's why this constitution, uh, amendment of the constitution is important. For example, the, uh, the status, social status of the Japanese self-defense force uh, members, soldiers, has changed if, the, the, if the, there is a clear written sentences. Because uh, still the people doubt which this is legal or not. That's not good for soldiers who sacrifice their lives in the battle. And uh, if the social status has lies, what will happen? That is another matter. So that is the uh, issue of the amendment of the constitution. So amendment of the constitution itself is not uh, create something new. But if Japanese uh, uh, public opinion accept to amend the constitution, this means that mood in Japan has changed. That is the reason this amendment of the constitution is one kind of the parameter to understand Japan. So well, that's uh, my answer. And uh, another, uh, another question, uh, North Korea's cyber attack to Japan or the cyber security cooperation between India and Japan. This is very important and really progressed. Even if the Quads, they mentioned it, and the bilateral summit, of course, they mentioned it. Cyber security is a big matter. Because uh, cyber security, is, North Korea is very strong because their infrastructure do not depend on the internet, but our infrastructure depends on internet. So, because they are very old, uh, that's why the, it is uh, that kind of situation has happened. But uh, but at the same time, the, indeed, uh, about the cyber security, it's, uh, it is uh, a little difficult to understand the capability of the cyber security. Uh, of course, uh, UK think tank IISS ranked uh, some country is good and some country is bad, and uh, as a rank. They try to do that. This is an important calculation of the important challenge to solve this. But at the same time, the cyber security, why small country has the advantage, small country like North Korea, or the recently the uh, COVID-19 pandemic, the capability of the Vietnam has uh, attracted because Vietnam has identified the pandemic before the world realized it, and the people think because of the because of the skill of the computer. Uh, the, uh, of course, Vietnam. Uh, refuse to admit it, but uh, it is true. So it is true that uh, many media think at least. Uh, so cyber capability of the cyber security is a little difficult to identify, even if the small country can rise their capability. And uh, Japan tried to support ASEAN country, and India tried to cooperate with ASEAN, the cyber security area, and India and Japan has uh, cooperated the cyber security area. So that's why the cyber security cooperation is, is, it is really possible. And uh, so, but uh, uh, I'm, how is it very difficult? Because the cyber, in case of cyber security, the most important uh, problem is uh, who takes charge, indeed. For example, the company has a deal with the sensitive technology, but this company's computer controlled by company. Government cannot intervene this uh, inside of the uh, company. Government cannot control the company itself. Because uh, in case of the cyber security, if uh, in inside of the company, company should take charge. Military force cannot control the each companies uh, because they do not have the right to control it. it. They cannot control the business itself. This as an area of the company should take charge. So in, in, even if the other country try to attack these companies, the uh, uh, defense force cannot intervene the situation. In this case, the company should defend themselves. So in the democratic countries, uh, legal system is important. When talk about the cyber security, every time problem is who takes charge. In the governmental organization, of course, the security force or the cyber security force of the police or uh, 
、えっと、セトラ、can take charge, but civil sector, we cannot intervene. But civil sector, but weak point if the attacker found. This is the area of the breach of the defense line of the cyber security. So that's why this is very difficult. So controversial area. So cyber security cooperation is possible, but how to, how to protect is very difficult indeed. Oh, well, right. Okay, I should solve this. Yeah. <laughs> it's okay. Okay, so uh, Ryan and uh, Smriti have asked similar questions. I'm mixing them. So they ask, what is Japan's response to uh, within the port structure and also outside of it uh, regarding the increasing alliance between J Russia and China? And also, what do you think other Asian countries, which are neutral, like India? And uh, more who are more pro US or more pro Western countries in Asia should respond to this uh, increasing partnership between the two giants. Due from the maintaining or uh, respecting rule based order, of course, we should cooperate, but at the same time, each country has its interest. Then, in case of Japan, we have the big four big wars with Russia, and we know the how Russian soldiers. Uh, uh, war crime against Japanese in the past. That's why the, when the war has started in Ukraine and the news of the war crime in the uh, uh, city around the Kiev or other cities we had, we remember what happened against Japan. That's why Japan's stance is very clear, Japan stand with Ukraine. But in case of India, the India did not share the border with Russia. That's why the India is completely different uh, in this case. That's understandable indeed. Uh, so how to detach China and Russia? Uh, this is a very important priority for both of the India and Japan. In this case, uh, we should we should not allow the country to change the status quo by force by ignoring the rule based order. That's very important. That's why the Japan tried to persuade India in the past, but uh, with the US or the European ally, that's true. But at the same time, now Japan start to understand how different between India and Japan, and start to accept, start to accept the opinion of uh, India or other Southeast Asian country or countries in the Middle East also. Uh, so Japan try to adjust and Japan try to mend uh, the situation uh, currently. For example, the what is a uh, what is a problem is of course how to deter Russia is a problem how to deter China is a problem don't not uh, deter the relation with the Southeast Asia or the India or uh, Middle East it, this is not a uh, situation we want to create so indeed uh, we can understand each other in this case and uh, it will create a bright future for us because and uh, I, I, I only short time that I need to point out one thing. Russia, militarily, Russia is strong, but economically, Russia is poor. The China, militarily strong, but economically, they are strong too. So in the long run, China will be the big issue. China will be the more big issue. China will expand influence to Russia in the future, and China will be the only big matter for us. In this case, India and Japan share the same problem. So in the long run, there's no problem. Russia's problem will not change the India-Japan cooperation, I think. But that's what I want to say. Thank you. Thank you very much. One last question from my end. Uh, I wanted okay. to ask about the Russia-China uh, dilemma that you said that Russia is not economically stronger, but China is. So in the long run, China is a bigger issue. So I wanted to ask, like for US, uh, the way they have been focusing on the whole Russia-Ukraine war, they have been prioritizing Russia over China. To the point that it may look like it, uh, uh, U.S. is playing a more increasingly more passive role in the Indo-Pacific region. So, do you think this kind of a discord between the divergent views regarding who is the bigger threat with, within the Quad nations, especially like U.S.A., Japan, India, and Australia, do you think that can actually become a problem for Quad nations and also the other countries who want to cooperate with the Quad to, you know, counter the Chinese presence and the Chinese threat in the Indo-Pacific region? 
Yes, uh, that's a big problem. That's why Japan decided to increase our defense budget to share more security burden in this region. Because uh, if uh, something happened in the uh, in the past here, because of the Russia, uh, Russia is a main matter for the United States. The United States cannot share the enough support to Japan. That will be the nightmare for Japan, especially when the China invade Taiwan. Uh, that case uh, we are worrying just now. So that's why Japan should take more role. That's uh, we, uh, we start to understand. But at the same time, why Japan focusing on the Russia's aggression of Ukraine? Because if the China uh, invade Taiwan, in this case, we need not only the US support, but also the European support too. Because uh, if the European buy the Chinese weapons or, or as a surprise uh, weapon pass to the China, the, our enemy will be big. So that is that case, uh, we, we ask the European to stop the cooperation with China because we, uh, we cooperate with uh, Europe in the Ukraine issue. That is uh, our deal, I think. So if NATO expands to the East Asia, it will be welcome. Well, uh, NATO side will not accept it, I think. But so anyway, uh, Kishida will join the NATO summit next week. That because uh, Japan tried to pass the European to cooperate, counter China strategy, that's true. But at the same time, in the future, China and Russia will be one we expect because uh, Russia needs China now. And uh, because the semiconductor supply without uh, supply from China, Russia cannot uh, make the semiconductor. This means that Russia cannot produce the weapons now. So Russia needs China. Russia, is, uh, China is only buy, uh, main buyer for the Russia's product now. So this means that in the future, in the future, China will control everything. And uh, under such kind of situation, uh, anyway, Japan need to face all of the three, the China and China's former ally North Korea and China control Russia. Uh, it is unavoidable, at least uh, next uh, near future. Uh, and uh, if uh, China and Russia will separate in the future, that will be welcome for Japan. But uh, before the current situation, we need to expect, we need to fight the, with them. Uh, this is the uh, destiny and the Jap uh, Japan's location. We cannot escape. Indeed, but uh, one more thing I need to say. Last 2000 years, only country to occupy Japan was the United States. China tried to do, Russia tried to do every time Japan won. So Japan have, I think the Japan still have the confidence to deal with all of the three enemies at the same time indeed. Right, the history has been in favor of Japan. That is true with the Russo Japanese, Japanese war and Sino Japanese war. So let's hope it stays like that for Japan. Uh, Ma'am, you can take over. Thank you so much, Dr. Nagao. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Nagao, so much. Um, on behalf of the Center for Security Studies at the Jindal School of uh, International Affairs, uh, we would like to thank you for this wonderful talk, rather insightful talk. Uh, the fact that you focused about uh, rule-based order, the need for Quad to be a unilateral organization, so as to balance the military, uh, so as to balance China's military issues, and also talk about how uh, we need to work together in order to tackle China in the future is something uh, we all are facing at the moment. And I mean, the way you suggested things seem very interesting. Uh, also, thank you so much for taking in all the questions and uh, taking in. I would say futuristic questions in a very nice way. So thank you so much for your time and we hope you come again for other events which we organize in the future. Thank you and have a good day. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Rising. A little wrong explanation, I think. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Nagal. Um, uh, can you please everyone stay for a second? I'll we just take a screenshot and then we can, thank you so much. Just one second. All right. All right. One, two, three. All right. Thank you. Thank uh, you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Jai Hind. Jai Hind. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.